Hello everyone. This afternoon, I'm going to be speaking about light from the perspective of my subject, physics. Now, physics is the study of the whole universe, right from the very large to the very small. And I'd like to think about light from both of these points of view. To do this, I'm going to pose and then attempt to answer three fundamental questions about light. What is it? Where does it come from? And is there such a thing as light that we can't see? So to start with, what is light? Well, light is an example of an energy pathway, a carrier by which energy is taken from a region of high concentration outwards to the surroundings. This is similar to the way in which wind can transport pollen or seeds from a flower without itself interacting at the destination. But light isn't quite like the wind. It isn't made of matter, it doesn't have mass, we can't touch it. So what is the nature of this substance, this light? Scientists have been debating it for centuries. This started with Hooke and Newton in the 17th century, then through Young, Hertz, Einstein, Maxwell, and more recently, Dr. Lena Howe today. This is because light undergoes several different phenomena. It will reflect, bounce off a surface. It will refract, change direction upon entry to us a new material, and it will undergo polarization, where it is confined to one plane only. The confusion sets in when light is passed through a gap in a barrier. Much like the water you see behind me, it will diffract. This is a property of waves, and it's exaggerated when the gap in the barrier is similar in size to the wavelength of the light. Light will un also undergo interference, and this can be observed most clearly on a screen or even on a peacock feather, where the waves interact with one another. The discovery of the photoelectric effect changed everything. In the photoelectric effect, light is shone on a metal surface. Metal surfaces are made of atoms and these atoms will release their electrons if they receive enough energy from the light. So you might think that by increasing the brightness or power of the light, that you'll increase the likelihood of an electron being released. Interestingly, it's the color of the light, its frequency or wavelength, that will determine whether or not electrons are released. This only makes sense if a chunk of light instantaneously transfers all of its energy to an electron in one go. Now, this would indicate that light is made of particles, which we call photons. And this is a proven technology. We find them in solar cells, in our homes or in our businesses. On to our next question. Where does light come from? This is where we're going to deal with the very large and the very small. Starting with the large, you might know that stars are an example of a source of light. Stars are also an example of a theoretical black body. You might know that a black body is an object that absorbs and emits all colours of light. So if we were to look at the spectrum of light from a star, we would see all of the colours, from violet to red in the rainbow. And their combination is what gives us the appearance of white light. This light, this energy, is coming from nuclear fusion inside the star, the clashing together and combining of nuclei of atoms. And the extent to which nuclear fusion takes place, the temperature of the star, tells us which colours of light are going to be most vibrant for a given star. As we can see on this simulation, when we increase the temperature of a star, the black body curve moves towards the left and the peak moves closer to the violet and away from the red. Our sun has a temperature of about 6,000 Kelvin, or 6,000 degrees, and this gives it its yellowish colour. But nonetheless, the sun is still an example of a black body, so if we were to look at its spectrum in full, we would expect to see every colour without break. So what are these black lines telling us? This gives us a clue as to where light comes from on the atomic scale. Take a moment to consider a bookcase. If you were to take a book off a low shelf 
and place it onto a higher shelf, you would be using some energy. If you were to do this process again and again, continuing to take books from a lower shelf and placing them higher, you'd be working against the gravitational force. You would use up so much energy that you would need to refuel. This is the same process that happens in atoms when light is absorbed. And it's this process that gives us our black lines, our absorption lines on the visible light spectrum from a star. So why does this happen? Where does the force come from in an atom? Well, electrons are attracted to their nucleus because electrons have a negative charge and the nucleus has a positive charge. When light strikes an electron, it gives it its energy and it becomes excited to a higher energy level. Just like in your bookshelf, you have certain shelves at certain heights. In an atom, the electrons have certain precise, discrete, levels that they can go to and it's these exact frequencies or energies of light in the photons that can be absorbed by a particular atom. You've probably heard the saying what goes up must come down. Just as the electrons in our atoms can absorb light, when they go down an energy level they emit light. Incidentally, the element neon is only able to produce one colour of light, red, and yellow lights come from sodium atoms. Laser is actually an acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Make sense? Fluorescent objects work in a similar way. A very energetic colour of light, like blue or violet, causes an electron to become very excited, right up to the higher energy levels. On the way back down, after some time, the electron will stop at more than one energy level, and therefore it releases colours of light, like green, which are of lower energy. So light comes from stars and atoms, but what about the light in this room, or our home, or on our streets? Well, each of these can sort of be categorised as a star or an atom. A filament light bulb, for example, contains a metal at a very high temperature, something like 3000 Kelvin. We know that these hot objects produce a black body spectrum and that the temperature of the object will cause a certain colour of light to be predominant. So our normal light bulbs are just like little red stars. Fluorescent tube lighting uses the emission of electrons. Interestingly, the atoms in the middle of the tube are mercury, which produce invisible light. And the energy they release gets converted into visible light by phosphorus atoms on the outside of the tube. Hence, fluorescence. So now we come to our final question about invisible light, light that we can't see. Well, this does exist. There's lots of it. In fact, the spectrum that I have been mentioning extends far beyond the colours that I've shown you from that violet to that red. Overall, it's called the electromagnetic spectrum. In order from shortest wavelength to longest wavelength, we have gamma radiation, which is essential for radiotherapy in cancer treatment. X-rays, which, as you might have experienced, can be used for medical imaging. Ultraviolet, useful for detecting forged banknotes, the visible light that we've been discussing so far, infrared radiation, better known as heat, microwaves for heating food and for all of your mobile phone communications, and lastly, radio waves. So why is it that I'm allowed to call all of these things light, all of these regions of the electromagnetic spectrum? Well, they have a lot in common. They all travel at the same speed through the vacuum of space. That's 300 million meters per second. They all reflect and refract. They are all an example of an energy pathway, these carriers of energy. And they are all produced by certain types of star and certain types of atom. But some of these regions are more energetic than others. For example, gamma radiation is ionizing which means that it is capable of damaging our DNA. Gamma radiation tends to behave like particles most of the time, or photons. Radio waves, on the other hand, are whole meters to kilometers long, enabling them to diffract around buildings and mountains. 
a wave behavior. Visible light, the section in the middle, just happens to hold the exact wavelengths that our eyes, our retinas are able to detect and that our brain is able to interpret. Last month, a student asked me, where does light go? Why does it run out? Why is it that we can't see light from a torch or from a star that's a great, great distance away? In response to him, I said, it's not that the light disappears. Energy can't be destroyed. It's just that the intensity of the light has been spread over such a large area, or perhaps that there were so many atoms with electrons absorbing the light along the way that it's no longer detectable by the cells in our eye. As we approach the end of our lecture, I'd like to return to our questions from the start. What is light? Where does light come from? And is there such a thing as light that we can't see? Hopefully we can all agree on some of the answers now. Energy pathways, waves, photons, stars, atoms and electrons, and the electromagnetic spectrum. So what is there left to discover about light, this substance? Plenty. For example, is it possible to manipulate the speed and direction of light? What's really happening to light in the process of photosynthesis? Can light tell us something about the future of our universe using the light from galaxies and the notion of redshift? And most importantly of all, how can we manipulate light to improve the speed of our Wi-Fi connection. Thank you all very, very much for watching and listening. Goodbye.